What's up, YouTube? Welcome back to Celio's Network. Today, we are doing the metagame discussion for the Indianapolis Regionals coming up next weekend. Um, what's the date for that? It is May 7th, May 7th and 8th. May 7th and 8th. Uh, so, the last major event was the European International Championships, which uh, just happened a few days ago at the time of recording this video. And I've got two lovely guests with me here today. They both did fairly decent, I'd say, at EUIC. <laughs> um, uh, just before we introduce them, quick shout out to the sponsors of the channel, uh, PotownStore.com and CardTroopergames.com. You can use code CELIO for 5% off at both of those sites. Check out Beast Coast Pokemon, a separate YouTube channel of collaborative Pokemon content, and also PokemonCard.io, where I share my lists. You can share your own, and I uh, am newly affiliated with Dragon Shield Sleeves. You can find the links to that in the description down below as well, as well as any links that Justin and Frank mention. I will link below their Twitters, anything like that that they want in the description. You can find everything you need there so today we've got justin bokari and frank persick with us to discuss the developing metagame going into the indianapolis regionals which so far is going to be the largest major event happening post pandemic or post return from the pandemic whatever you want to say because i think there's like over a thousand tcg players registered and it's safe to assume that around 900 or so of them are probably masters uh, so why don't we have uh, Justin and Frank introduce themselves. Uh, I'm going to also just leave the Limitless pages for both of these players in the description, because if you have any, uh, you know, second chance, a second guessing of why am I listening to these people, just take a quick look at the Limitless page. All of those worries will go away. Um, Justin, why don't you go ahead and give, our, uh, give yourself a quick intro. What's up, guys? My name is Justin Bokari. I'm a player from New Jersey. I've been playing the game for quite a while. Started in 08. So you could probably call me ancient. Um, I took a little break during like the 2013 to 2015 period, but picked the game back up when I guess the modern era uh, kind of came to the scene and uh, did pretty well at UIC. As Luke mentioned, got top eight and uh, excited to get back into IRL events. Awesome. Yeah, Justin and I have both been playing about the same time. Like, we used to be in finals of Battle Roads in the seniors yeah, division against each those. other yes. and stuff. Yes. So that's sick. It's sick to have you on the channel. Um, And then go ahead, Frank. Yeah, so my name is Frank Persick. Uh, I live in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. I've been playing since 2016 I started. Um, and then I've uh, done okay um i i am mostly known for building unique and interesting decks um which i is a badge that i wear with quite a bit of honor for sure um i recently got second at at the european international championship which is great it's my first tournament um back since the pandemic i was just coming off of a uh, of back-to-back -back top 16 finishes so mm -hmm. it was really nice to get that like that big finish, right? Not just like with top eight for the third time in a row. Yeah. Um, and those top 16 yeah. finishes, you were part of Roxy Chomp and Ucram. So innovative deck to innovative deck yes. to innovative deck. <laughs> oh, yes. Hopefully um, <laughs> I can keep that momentum going, but there are only only so many cards that can be good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It was actually really funny you say that too, because um, there's a tweet that I had pulled up when we were talking about, I had I had made the Flygon deck as well. The, it was uh, I played it at the full grip tournament with the B drill and stuff, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. This is like Flygon RC's B drill deck, and I was back and forth on Twitter with like Rahul and some. I think it was Justin Bean, and because Justin had played it in um, Salt Lake, and I was like, oh man, I can't believe I like let this deck get out. I should have just saved it. And then Rahul was like, oh man, if you told me about it, I hundred percent would have just played it in. Salt Lake, and then my other tweet was like, uh, or he was like, I would 100% played it in Europe if like you had kept it a secret. And I was like, oh, I'll just have to make a new deck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah Frank, <laughs> always a new deck yep. coming from Frank. And I'm really happy to see you get the big finish with your deck because yes, i know you. a lot of times you'll make the big deck and then someone else like hunter will take it to the finals or you know. So I'm glad to see you get your second place with it. Yeah, Hunter messaged me the night before the tournament. 
And he's like, you cursed yourself. And I was like, <laughs> what? I was like, what What happened? Like, did I do something wrong? Like, did somebody find out about the deck? And like, it got, you know, everybody knows about it. Yeah. And I was like freaking out. And I, he called me. He's like, call me, call me. And I was like, what? He's like, oh, wow. He's like, you gave the deck to Finn and Finn's going to play it. And now he's going to do better than you. Like, the curse. <laughs> yeah, like, the curse. Was, <laughs> you were so close. So good, but then. yeah, you got, I know. You I got was, out there in the finals. So. Uh, heck yeah. So, uh, the first question is going to be, you know, involving the decks that both of you selected for this event. Um, actually pause question number zero that we're, we amended to the outline that I forgot about. Um, first we're going to talk about, um, how the juniors and seniors metagame in Indianapolis might be a little different than the masters before we get into the main, uh, outline of questions here because somebody mentioned that on twitter so shout out to them for reminding me we should talk about the juniors and seniors so um frank were did you play in juniors and seniors division at all in your career no no i started playing when i was 20 so okay. i have only been playing i actually scratch so yeah no like technically no but like when i i had played a little bit when i was younger like casually I had, like, gone to like a pre-release and like maybe like two, one or two cities when i was like in seniors okay and i was this is like 2008 or 2009 um but th for like serious play like i was yeah 20 years old it was 2016 right okay so justin you played as uh below masters you played as a senior yeah in compatible two play. years in seniors yeah so um do you have any like first impressions on like what the meta might exclude for juniors and seniors or what it might have extra of that we're not really going to talk about in the masters portion of the discussion uh okay so uh like i mentioned i did play two years in seniors but i i think i also have a little bit of experience with like junior metagaming because i have two younger siblings for people who don't know uh my sister Nadia and my brother Zachary both played when they were juniors, so I did help them a little bit when they were juniors. So I guess just from my experience with that, uh, when I used to help them, uh, just talking about the junior division now, like something I noticed is the junior division usually only plays the meta deck. So if we're talking about, for example, if you were talking about going into EUIC, I would have expected just Mew, Arceus, and Malamar for the junior division, really not anything else. But uh, if I was thinking like for the Masters, for example, I would have expected more rogue decks, some some things to come up, kind of like how Urshi and Whimsicott came into the scene. I would definitely not expect that for juniors. It is possible, but it's not something I would expect. Um, and then for seniors, I think that's maybe like one step higher where I would expect some innovation, but still kind of focus on the three, I guess, meta decks at the time. And then kind of just having a list that focuses on that, beating those three while being consistent and not really worrying about anything else, if I guess that makes sense. Absolutely. So what would you say um, a senior or junior right now practicing for the event should expect to see in their six or so rounds? So I think uh, Urshi did win seniors, right? If mm -hmm. I, if Caleb, I believe. I believe. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, okay. So then I would definitely expect there to be some Urshi in seniors, and I would expect probably Arceus and Mew those kind of three, I think Malamar's kind of fallen off right now. So if I were a senior or helping a senior going into Indy, I would say kind of focus on having a game plan against Urshi, Arceus, and Mew. Um, I'm not necessarily in that order, but definitely those three decks in general. And if your deck can beat those three decks, I think you probably have a pretty solid deck and, and have a great shot at winning the event. Awesome. Frank, do you have any additional thoughts on that? Yeah, I would agree with that. I think one of the biggest things to look at as far as like masters versus seniors and juniors is just like the longevity of the tournament, right? Like for masters, like one thing I consider is like you have to play 14 rounds plus, you know, top eight plus top four. And so your deck really needs to like be able to just like keep kicking like after 14 rounds, whereas like juniors and seniors, um, you know, there's not going to be as much variance. There's not going to be as many decks as you play, like kind of like Justin was saying. And so if you just have a deck that you're super comfortable with and super familiar with, I think that'll take you much further in juniors and seniors than it, than it would in masters because in masters, you really like 14 rounds, like you're going to have to prepare for like everything and all different scenarios and different decks and things people are metagaming. Whereas I think like you're saying, the metagame is like a little more straightforward, and like just like less rounds as well. So the, the variance is, isn't as, as much. And so I think, you know, if you're preparing for the tournament, just going with what you're most comfortable with and, you know, just a deck that's like a strong, solid, like fundamental deck rather than trying to just like break the format or whatever, I think is good. Um, 
especially, I mean, in other certain decks, like, Urshifu is like a hard deck to play. Like, I'm a master and I can't even play Urshifu. <laughs> yeah, there, well, there's a lot look. of lines of play. There's a lot of thinking. Your your working memory is really working in, with with Rapid Strike Urshifu, except the way, especially the way that all the lists in top eight are built. Um, so I think that could maybe come into play there. Um, not saying that seniors and juniors can't play the hard to play decks, but also with less time to prepare, there's also the fact of just nerves and the comfortability of the deck they were already practicing could potentially be coming into play. Oh no, yeah, like I mean, yeah, sorry, I definitely want to highlight that too. Like obviously, like Urshifu won seniors, mm -hmm. and like that player probably way better than me <laughs> as far as like piloting uh you know hard to play decks can go for sure but it's like or in masters like i can expect maybe you know I could, I could definitely expect to play like three or four like good like strong solid urshifu players whereas like maybe in juniors or seniors you'll, you'll like one only, or two maybe, maybe play like one or two yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah i mean so masters like divisions is just higher right like if you talk about like the top five percent of players in masters that's maybe like 50 100 150 players but if you talk about that in juniors or seniors that's maybe like two or three players that kids have on their radar as like the people to beat um because it's just exactly. a such, such a smaller population all right well thank you guys for talking about the juniors and seniors with me there uh, could i add something oh yeah go ahead Justin. Before I wrap up, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, something i think that juniors and seniors should keep in mind too compared to masters is i think masters have more room for margin of error like we can go x2 and then day two and still have like and still probably lose another round uh, depending on if you tied or not before you make top eight while juniors and seniors can only afford one loss in their swiss right most mm -hmm. of the time they have to go x11 but i think something to take in uh, into account is make sure like while it's good to have techs in your deck i think having a very consistent deck to make sure that you can go that x11 is very important because uh, you don't have as much room for margin of error as the masters do especially in the early rounds mm -hmm. yeah that's a great point yeah with those less rounds comes uh a greater weakness of you know losing or tying or whatever so you want to have a consistent yeah. deck that's closing out games okay great well yeah let's go into um the main outline of questions here we have for you guys today we're going to start with backpedaling here a little bit to the decks that justin and frank piloted to euic so let's start with justin um what led you and your group to the deck that you selected which was rapid striker shifu and Teleon? um and also previous to the event starting were you guys like confident like right before round one like this deck is very good we can all go the distance okay so about i want to say a week before the event uh sam uh chen had brought up uh in our group like hey why is like an attacking urshifu deck with like dark stuff bad and then we had kind of built a base list and then we just started kind of playing games with that and eventually kind of slowly started morphing into the limitless list and then uh, we kind of just kept grinding more games. I think probably, uh, I want to say the Wednesday before the event until the event itself, like we probably played, I want to say like at least four to 500 games with just the list. Isaiah played probably the most games out of all of us. He just kept grinding the deck over and over until we got to the list that we got to. But that is definitely the deck we played the most with uh, by far. We just kind of kept running it through the gauntlet of Mew, Malamar, and Arceus. That's really all we were worried about at the time and making sure the deck was obviously consistent enough to set up in most games. Um, but once we figured out that, hey, this deck is strong, it can handle those three decks, that's when we just kept pushing through and trying to refine the list and then kind of got to the point where it was at the end. I mean, we have tried so many different stuff. We tried the Elder Goss, we tried uh, Moltres V, we had a Sincino, we had Viberal in there, we had a bunch of other things that ended up getting cut until we got the final list at the end. Nice. So you guys felt pretty confident then if you were beating the gauntlet of the top three, in your opinion? Yeah. So uh, it initially started with uh, Mew, and like <laughs> the Mew matchup is crazy. I think uh, we joke with Isaiah that he could write his college thesis on that matchup because there's just so many different lines you could take with that matchup. Like, uh, just like if the the Mew player goes leap on turn one into Genesec when they're fire prizes, they can leap at four. They could just leave it active. I mean, just so many different things. I mean, that's why we originally had Moltres V, then I'm getting dropped because if the Mew player did, did this, then Moltres V is useless. And then like, so a lot of things got taken into account. We assumed that uh, each player who was playing the specific matchup, I guess, would play 
it correctly, I guess, just the word you want to use. So that was the way we chose each card, mm -hmm. uh, which is why I guess our list might differ from some others. And uh, but we definitely felt comfortable with uh, those three matchups anyway. And I guess any random stuff we might uh, hit just because MetaCham and Urshifu are pretty broken. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You could just sweep some boards that way. Um, so how about you, Frank? Same question. Um, what led you and uh, your group that helped you test Whimsicott, uh, what led you to Whimsicott and uh, previous to the event, were you confident? Like round zero, were you, uh, did you think you were making day two, top eight, all of that? Yeah, I was really confident in the deck before the tournament. I had spent more time testing for this tournament than I, I had for pretty much uh, most other tournaments in, in the past, um, for sure. Honestly, actually, like I had the so the two tournaments before COVID, like the ones that I had top sixteen, I um has like was like just starting a new job and like had more like flexibility and had like spent a lot more time just like practicing and grinding matchups and like it was this crazy thing whereas like I played a bunch of games before the tournament and then I went there and I did well and I was like oh well we should try this again <laughs> and so I I knew that I was flying out. To Europe on like March 23rd is when I booked my flight and so it was just like that day um started just grinding games like after work every day for like a couple hours and so I worked on a couple decks I worked on like um Arceus Sanaconda Duraladin box with Barbarrel at first and that just was like kind of bricking a lot and then I moved on to Rapid Strike Intellion with a Rapid Strike Phalanx in there to deal with uh Arceus and like a couple other cute things um but i i had been going back and forth and the hardest thing for me was just like finding people to test with honestly so my main people that i test with are are two of my like local players um jesse parker and, and rob stevens and I, I test with them a lot um and they're always just like down to especially if they're not not attending the tournaments like neither of them are going to euic but they're just like super accommodating and just like yeah any matchup you want to test and like figure it out and and so they're like super awesome and so I tested with them a couple of times and then I was like looking for people like actually going to Europe to test with. And so I knew I was staying like in my hotel room. It was like myself, Michael Catron, Gabe Smart, um, Nicholas Moffitt, um, Finn and um, Ben Branch. And I Finn was always like super busy. Um, but we got to test like a couple times and then I wanted to test with Nick a little bit, but he, we only got to test like once or twice. Um, and so I actually, I actually ended up messaging, um, Cyrus Davis, who I knew was going, like when I saw that they had tweeted out that they registered and I was like, we please test with me. <laughs> and so we found a routine where, where they would get off work at like pretty, pretty late. I think we we would start testing at like like 10 30 11 p.m and i go to work like at like eight in the morning and so i was up from like 11 to like two like testing with with cyrus so for, like, a, a lot of dedication and was this all with Whimsicott? oh yeah and so yeah we eventually made it sorry i've been going on for a minute here how we made it to Whimsicott is um um i had seen the deck do well online and so one day, I think, like, before I started testing with Cyrus, like, I think maybe they were at work or whatever. I'd run some games with them. And then the weekend came around, and I saw that Cyrus had actually won or got second at an event with Whimsicott. And I had we'd been going back and forth, and I hadn't talked to them in, like, a day or two. And so I messaged them and was just like, so Whimsicott, right? Mm -hmm. And they were like, yeah, I think it's pretty good. I was like, no, you don't understand. Like, I've been playing this. Like, I think this there's something there. And so um then just went all in on the deck and, and kind of like Justin was saying it's just like you know refining it and playing games and testing matchups and so um it's pretty obvious the meta was just going to be a bunch of Arceus and Talion, a bunch of Mew and some Malamar and then like a few niche other things and so um just started testing those matchups the Mew obviously felt good you could lock the special energy um and then the Arceus actually we struggled with at first but was able to just like figure out how to do the matchup and it was just like timing your fluff ball star right and so we had been back and forth on a couple things of like whether to include a 1-1 one -one Arceus line because the deck was having trouble setting up and then using um you know star birth but then the more that we had realized like how the Arceus matchup goes and like uh, I you know the more that I realized like how important fluff ball star was it really came down to just like adding a crowbat and adding like a ton of ball search and mm -hmm. a bunch of these other things and so 
Um, we were flying the list um, pretty well, and then I think the biggest problem that the deck had was just like the energy acceleration, like hitting the Raihan at the time was just like super annoying and difficult to do sometimes, and you could just lose games where you just like your energy was gone. Right. And so then one day Cyrus had messaged me, and they were just like exp share and i was like what and uh, you so know, exp kind of share cold. let's stop there for a second because exp share is kind of like an an unmarked territory and competitive in you know competitive meta decks right now it's not a card that some a lot of players might not even know it's in standard format so when, i didn't i did not <laughs> so when you when you start testing exp share maybe like a week or days or whenever before an international championship do you start thinking am i just playing a meme am i just playing a pile am i flying all the way to europe to play xp share no no i okay. was super pumped about okay. it so it felt like you cracked um, the code yeah no I, this was all this is all cyrus for the xp share like I, I, that was not me at all actually that was like the the really that cracked the code for okay. sure the problem with the deck is like you couldn't keep good tempo yeah like you because there you you need two attachments per whimsicott and obviously if you want to get a big fluff ball star off as well like you need to attach multiple energy and so there were just so many plays where just like you needed to hit the raihan and just having that as your supporter for the turn really and then just like only having no search for it was just like super annoying and so the exp share made it so you just like kept up that tempo and could stream attacks and it was like genius it was actually like the most brilliant card in the deck and um, so, that's all thanks to cyrus so you put a lot of time into whimsicott now did uh going on to the next question i'm sorry and you also said you were very confident in whimsicott right like before round one started yeah so we the deck like the final list of the deck was probably done like a week before the tournament started and then it was just like grinding matchups to make sure you know that i knew it like the back of my hand and so by the time i actually like landed in europe like i knew that the 60 i was playing for like quite some time and I, I felt pretty confident in it for sure so moving on to the next question we'll start with justin were you and your group surprised that like four other groups of prominent players brought almost the same archetype? A little bit. Like we had joked around the night before, like should we put Manaphy in if other people play Urshi? And then we're like, nah, it should be fine. And okay. then lo and behold, a bunch of people ended up playing Urshi. So we, we expected maybe a couple, but we didn't expect like, I guess the slew of it that was going to be in top eight and then uh, we didn't even test that matchup, right? So as you can see, we probably we did not expect uh, to play against it that much, if at all. Right now, obviously, Tor did. Obviously, Tor right. did. <laughs> so so let's say you expected just Tor, and just let's say you just expected the Limitless people to play it. You don't expect, you know, any of the other European or Australian or any other American groups that did bring it to bring it. Um, so when you guys are going into the tournament thinking that like okay maybe one other group also landed on the deck we did but we're not going to worry about that because we have to get through all the day one decks all the day two decks and then maybe we don't even end up seeing them is that kind of what you guys landed on yeah correct so i think the biggest part with urshi in general is just space and like we just felt like we couldn't sacrifice a card for something that may or may not happen if right. like, obviously if we were sure we would have put it in mm -hmm. but just something that was so unsure just wasn't worth the spot like the two last the three last minute inclusions were ended up being the mew which were a genius idea by Isaiah on the way over to give us like more reach and better turn one starts because obviously one of the biggest weaknesses is just the early game if you can survive the early game you're usually chilling throughout the rest of the game and the, uh, the other thing was the fourth drizzle because we found the one way Mew could win is if you prize a drizzle and they start drizzle hunting. Yeah. <laughs> they, you prize one, they knock out one. That means you only really have access to one throughout the whole game because you really don't want to claro for one. So uh, having access to two is really all you need to play the game. And that's why we added in the fourth. So really those spots couldn't be dropped. And then if we were to add the Manaphy, then we might have to drop one of the supporters or maybe play like some sketchy line somewhere else. So definitely was not, uh, worth it we thought in the end god yeah that's really that's really helpful for people thinking about teching against maybe their own deck or worrying about like maybe one percent two percent of players that might crack this or that deck then maybe you don't tech for it even if you want to win the event maybe you don't tech for it mm -hmm. um frank so 
you looked like uh you looked like big IQ guy going into that tournament with Whimsicott and then every like it's like it's exploding like every good player's playing Urshifu. If you're not playing Urshifu, what are you doing? Frank's sitting over there with Whimsicott, you know, psychic type, no special energy. Did you expect Urshifu? Yeah, actually. So my I'm usually like pretty good at predicting like like the meta game which is like how what it formulates like a lot of my deck choices. Right, you need to um, you need to know what people are going to play if you have if you're going to counter it, right? So yeah, I know for sure. And so like I knew that Urshifu would not be the most popular deck, but I knew like it was going to get played and the players that were going to play it were very good. That is like two things that I knew for certain. I knew like it's not a deck that you can just pick up. Like you can't just look at towards you know and and you know the 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 um Liverpool winning EUIC or the Liverpool winning um Urshifu list and then just like pick that up and bring it to a tournament. Like it's right. gonna require people who are very serious about the game, people who are gonna put a lot of reps in and people who who want to win. Because I know it's a very, very good deck and it was very capable of winning the tournament, but could only be piled by by very, very good players who who have the time and dedication to do that. So those were the players that I wanted to have a free matchup again not a free matchup but like you wanted to go you wanted to go in with the advantage on I wanted your to side turn my brain off when i had to play like to right or have to play yeah like, yeah i mean and when you get to the top level and you know both players are playing pretty perfectly you want to be able to be the person that went in with that advantage right you don't want to have to let the variance of the good hand settle who wins you know the mirror match between two top players if you can have some kind of advantage going into that like picking whimsicott if you think other good players are going to play urshifu exactly and that that really was a big part of the thought process i knew i could beat mew and i knew i could beat pretty much you know rcs and um but i i knew if i was gonna have to beat some of the top players i would need that competitive edge and just figuring they would play urshifu was big I actually didn't. <laughs> this is gonna sound bad. I did not test the Urshifu matchup beforehand because I thought it would be so free. And then I played against Nico Alabas day one, and he almost destroyed me two games in a row. And I was like, "Oh no! Like this is not gonna be as easy as I thought." And so then I spent um, the time in between day one and day two, like actually like being thoughtful and thinking right. how the matchup works and what do I need to do and what are they gonna, you know. Right. And like the night before, I was like going through Gustavo's list, like okay, what does he play? Like what can I actually do? And 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 so um, it wasn't a, a, you know as free or like as easy as I expected it to be, but it, it's still like a a good enough matchup. Yeah. Whereas like that, I think that's I'm, a good like, lesson though. Your free matchups are never free. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was I was happy to be piloting Whimsicott by the end of the tournament for sure, but. There was a moment there where like my heart sank for a minute and I was like, oh gosh, like this might not be uh, as easy as I thought of it. Um, so this one's also for you, Frank. Do you think Whimsicott is now a solidified meta deck, or was it a one and done for EUIC? No, I think it still sits in tier two, actually. It's my like it's gonna be my f so how I go about my tournament, I always have a deck that I'm like fall back on. Like mm -hmm. if I can't crack the meta or make some deck or like find something that i love or am comfortable with then i always have a deck i'm like okay though this is like I'm, what i'm comfortable playing i don't really need to test it i'm gonna just go into the tournament and pick it up and play it and i should be fine and that gives me time to focus on other things that i want to work on um and so for upcoming for um for indiana whimsicott is like my fallback deck like if i can't find something that i'm interested in different or something i think is even better like i think it's a fine deck i think it can do well i don't think um i think people are still a little more worried about urshifu and you know getting their rcs list to play hoopa and other things that i i think they can't really tech for everything and i think it's a deck that people might um discount i don't want to say right off but yeah i i think they're just like, like if well, we're if teching hit... for two decks whimsicott's like deck number five i want to tech for like there's yeah, a couple yeah, other on the food sure. chain I think players will definitely play more basic energy, but like the other thing is like I think the you know Whimsicott can still beat Mew if they play one basic energy and one training court. Um, anything more than that might be a little tough. Yeah. If they go two basic psychic and two training court, that that is like a little hard. I've beaten lists with three psychic in it before too. It's, it just depends, but um, um, so I think it's a fine play. I think it's not as good, obviously, because now people have deck knowledge. I like, mean, yeah. the list is like. I wouldn't change too much about the list. I would maybe change one words, but I mean, people have list knowledge and now people have, you know, they can get practice reps in with it. Whereas before going into USC, it's like, 
No one has any idea what I'm playing in my deck. No one right. knew there was a tool scrapper in there and they were attaching their tools at the wrong time and nobody knew, you know, had ever played against, you know, Whimsicott that much really. And so now it, it, it's, it gets slightly worse, but I, I, it's still a fine deck. I think it's still a good deck and I think it's still a deck that can definitely make day two or make top 16 as well or, or top eight. If you, I, I mean, I think I learned along the way like i had a lot of luck was in my favor to make the finals of eu i see like obviously i picked a good deck and i played very well but a lot of things went my way as well and so i think like the same thing can happen to another person playing with cotton in indianapolis as well it just won't be uh it'll just be a, a little bit different it won't be as uh as sneaky i don't think but i think it's still a tier two deck for sure cool um, Justin, so you said something earlier I wanted to piggyback off of real quick. You are mentioning about all the different lines that Mew could do, and you guys were preparing for that. Um, is there ever a deck like Mew or like Urshifu that you um, you or your group together um, assume that like only great players will play Urshi, um, or only like none of the top players are playing Mew, or none of the top players are playing this deck. So the play against Mew might be a little bit less refined from our opponent. So we don't have to worry about this play or that play. Or do you assume that your opponents are going to play perfect? So usually when we test, we just assume everybody will play perfectly because uh, we'd rather just know that if they play perfectly, we could still beat the deck rather than assuming that our, play our opponent won't play perfectly. I really don't think that's a good mindset to go in with. I'd rather just know that even if my opponent plays perfectly i still have lines to win the game mm -hmm. so that's usually how i test personally anyway and uh, my group as well cool yeah i just wanted because you kind of mentioned that i just wanted to clarify um and then also since i asked frank about whimsicott being a solidified meta deck um obviously your group none of the groups in euic were the first to come out with this kind of urshi dark and Teleon toolbox thing uh robin played the list that toward worked on and that limitless worked on in uh liverpool uh but does urshifu doing so well five out of the eight spots do you think that makes it less good now for indiana or does it just stay a very good deck because like a list like yours with quick shoot yoga loop can take care of manaphy over time um and the deck gives you so many lines um so do you think it gets countered so much or does it not really care about getting countered uh i think that the good thing about Urshi is you can kind of tailor your list to beat the counters. And also, even, I don't think the counters actually work. Depend, like, it depends on the deck. Yeah, like, I absolutely. Don't think, for example, you don't just Arceus, slap a Manaphy in and win. Exactly. Yeah, that, <laughs> like, I don't think Arceus can just have Manaphy, Dunsparce, plus like Clara, uh, Carrier, or Rod, and it solves all the problems, right? Like, uh, Urshifu could play Avery. I know we didn't, but I know uh, Tord and Pedro did, and then like, if you play Avery with those uh, two, when you have Manaphy and Dunsparce on the bench, then you're forced to keep those two, and then you have to decide between either get rid of all your Sabos or keep an X attacker, and then uh, then your board is really weak if you get rid of all the Sabos, and then maybe you can just pick off the Dunsparce the next turn, and then you can't bring it back, and then you basically, the cards you put into your deck have just become useless, and then they're hurt in other matchups as well. So I definitely think it's deck-dependent, and... Uh, the text might not even work, uh, even if you do put them in the deck, right? So definitely test them to make sure that they work. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've had so many formats and metagames and so many, like, uh, like kind of Bloodgate texts, like uh, Giratina promo. And I, I know yes. you are a big Greninja Break player. <laughs> and not every... Unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately. <laughs> not every deck just tossed Giratina into it and beat Greninja. Um, yeah. there was also, you know, there was also like, let's make sure this is the kind of deck that Giratina doesn't turn it from a 30, 70 to a 40, 60. Let's make sure it actually swings the matchup. So yeah, yeah make sure that your Manaphy is actually swinging the matchup. Um, so next question, uh, moving towards Indiana, I wanted to just ask you like the first kind of counter that comes to your mind for some of these archetypes. Um, so, um, kind of just helping viewers get into the mind of what the general, other player base might be thinking about to play to counter these decks um and so when you're when we're doing this try to specify an archetype or maybe a package of techs so maybe if i said uh what counters mu v max you might say gengar just because it's the obvious thing that comes to mind um so counter to rapid strike urshi justin uh i would say psychic like maybe hoopa v if we're going to talk about like rcs decks that's mm -hmm. I guess the first thing that comes to mind. I think that's harder 
as if I was the Urshi player, I think that's harder for me to deal with than a Mana Fee, for example. Uh, Frank, counter to Whimsicott. Um, oh, well, I've been seeing some Arceus decks that have chosen to include like a more Arceus box style deck, and some of them have, um, the, um, new Zamazenta V. Um, Zamazenta V from, um, from, why can I think of the set name? Brilliant Stars. Yeah, it's the new Brilliant set. Star. I don't yeah. know. I only keep wanting to say Astral Radiant. Yeah, I'm no, you, you made Whimsicott. You can forget a couple of things. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, um, the I Brilliant mean, I didn't Stars. Know was lethal, so. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither until Cyrus told me. But yeah, the Brilliant Stars, Zamazenta, I saw him making its way into decks. Um, Mew can make themselves, you know, a little less special energy reliant. Which, basic energy. Um, yeah, basic energy yeah. is literally just like a, pa almost a package tech for Whimsicott, so to speak, yeah. for, <laughs> for Mew. Basic energy, and then um, from Arceus can also put a little more energy recovery, too. Like, that matchup is very dependent on, no, I mean, obviously you want to take all your prizes, but you're just clearing their energy. Like, you'll just, like knock out an Arceus with two basics on it and then like fluffball star one and get rid of three basics. And then it's just like so hard for them to come back. Whereas if they played like uh, an extra, you know, like a rod or a retrieval or something like that, um, make it a little bit harder for Whimsicott as well. So just like more basic energy recovery and just ba raw basic energy uh, as well as, uh, you know, a metal attacker, if you can fit it for sure, which isn't easy to do, but <laughs> um, Justin uh, counter rapid strike Malamar. Uh, I think Avery is pretty solid against it. Um, I think that Memory Capsule Choteon is pretty solid against it, too. You can fit it in some deck. Um, those are the first two things that come to my mind. Uh, counter to Arceus and Teleon, Frank. Um, probably... So this is controversial. I, I like, I really like Sanaconda. Um, I know that sounds kind of silly, but the, I was thinking, like, with Arceus and Teleon, like, they can build their deck in such a way that you can do, like, a ton of, like, you know, just manipulate anything you want. And so, like, being able to just, like, choice ban boss, Zigzagoon, 220, two basic Urshfu V, or to uh, Zapdos and do 200 is, is good. And so... Right, and they can't do that um, to Sandaconda, because it has the same ability that... Can't do it to Sandaconda, right. baby! The same oh, ability so I... that Duraludon V has, that it takes 30 less from everything. So unless they have Path, Goon, Belt, boss energy evolve they don't knock out the sandaconda i think that's a really good card fan obviously broken card mm -hmm. um <laughs> fan and hammers and then um i really like um i think like tool scrapper tool jammer just tool denial is is really good right now especially against rcs because they're really reliant on that that 310 hp that they get or that that um the choice band output like their math is very precise and so if you can mess that up with like a tool denial i think that's pretty good too for sure soft counter uh justin uh counter to mew that you would play um i think dark stuff is good if you can fit the dark package in a deck like we did with urshi right so clara uh, baby mole trace basic dark energy yeah and i think frank proved special energy hate is also pretty good with the whim so you could do something like that like i know um isaiah and the group also played Sydney in, um, I think, Utah. So, yeah. like, anything that can, like, hit special energies as well, I think, is pretty good. And then uh, Frank also Mew. But not Whimsicott. Whimsicott can't be, be your answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think um, Avery is actually a very underrated inclusion for Mew as well. Like, obviously, people are playing it. And, like, it's good against Malamar. It's good against Suicune. It's good against Urshifu. But I think because Mew, their game plan for Path Marnie was to just like Rotom Phone the stadium on top, I think shaking it up a bit and then going like Path Avery. And now you can only drop to four and right. like, not having them not preemptively prepare for that. Yeah, I've been uh, explaining really it as Avery is like a good card against Malamar and sometimes it's pretty okay against Mew. And so like when you play a card like that that hits two pretty meta decks, um, it feels like you're putting a lot of value into your deck list. Yeah, and I think uh, Marnie, Path Marnie, it's a little bit stronger against me now because I think, like, because of Whimsicott, at least in my world, um, you know, people are playing more heavier, like, training courts and, and you know, heavier basic energy counts. And so now, um, by not having, like, Rose Tower, 
or whatever they were playing like tower of darkness or stadiums that draw them cards but instead like are there to like recover energy mm -hmm. you can kind of like brick them with path marnie a little bit easier as well if is if they're sacrificing like double turbo energies for psychics or something like that too it's like they now need multiple attachments so just like getting what they need is a little harder so also I think path marnie... also if mew is seeing like uh all the urshi dark decks are using dark attackers to beat them whimsicott is using energy denial maybe they start worrying a little less about path of the peak they might even cut their third stadium for marnie because you know everybody is saying you know play marnie for the bird decks because on the turn where you go down to three prizes you try marnieing them if they don't recover and they miss the attack there maybe you steal the game away um so more people now than ever are playing marnie and mew and um so that might be like they might just cut their second rose tower and just do one rose one training court if they were already down to three yeah um okay so next uh justin so you've been playing for a while like you talked about earlier and you've seen a lot of like best deck and formats come and go um do you think mew is really the best deck right now and if so why do so many top players like yourself choose not to play it um i do think mew is the best deck i think it probably has the highest power level i also think it's probably the hardest deck to play i think you could argue it's probably harder than urshi to play like 100 percent optimally just because mm -hmm. there's many so many actions every so many actions. yeah and uh, just for you to have to make the perfect decision with every single action is probably unreasonable right, right. so i definitely think that you could argue that um the reason why most top players don't play it I think it's probably because like anytime the deck is the I guess best or most popular deck, it, top players usually tend to stray away from it just because even if it is the top or uh, the best deck, I should say, if you have to play a hate deck every single round, it's just like it might not be favored, it might just un or even unfavored, it might be fifty fifty. By hitting a fifty fifty every single round, eventually just like variance might go the other side, and then you could lose a game to like something that that was out of your control rather than playing a deck that you know is just outright favored so as long as uh, you draw semi-optimally you should be able to win right so i guess that would be my reasoning why maybe some uh, top players might not be playing it right now yeah for sure um so moving on to mu v max a little bit more um so mu v max has been the most popular archetype at every major event so far we don't have confirmation on that for euic day one numbers yet um but the first four major events that we've seen since the season resumed mu has been far and away the most popular dwindling a little each time but still keeping that number one spot if you don't combine every single arceus deck into just saying it's arceus um so it has one one event, which was Brisbane, the smallest regional yet, and the first one. And then it placed second at one of the others. SLC, the largest one so far, had zero Mew in top eight. Um, so Frank, do you have an ex explanation for why the best deck had zero top eight placements at the largest event yet? The variant? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, no, I, I think that um at the time like you've seen that like graphic on on twitter or anywhere where it's like it's not necessarily like mew but it's like for like stuff like movie and text for decidueye it's like oh decidueye is really popular oh this tech goes up right or, oh you know and then people start cutting it and, oh the decidueye is good again and mm. then so i think it's like similar to like you know any deck really like mew just did super good an event there's Gengars everywhere in Salt Lake City mm -hmm. and, and all these, you know, different things that are, have a way of dealing with it. And so I think, like, Salt Lake City just being one of the largest regionals may have been coincidental. I think it's just, like, the metagame was at a point where it was just like, the most heavily antagonizing Mew at that tournament. And then, obviously, like, no Mew made top eight. So the next tournament, it was, like, not as heavily kind of teched against. Mm -hmm. And so... And by the time we get to EUIC, it's like more people are worried about Arceus, I felt, than they were about Mew. Um, and so I think it just is just where there's a point in the the metagame where, where Mew is just like not as heavily teched against or people people are kind of sleeping on it. So we've got to find um, that time to strike when it's time to play Mew again. Yeah, the Irons not, wasn't really hot in Salt Lake City. Right. And I'm not sure if that has to do with like the amount of people there, but just more so like how the format was. So Justin, um, this, this one's a curveball. It's not on the outline. Um, so with 
a lot of people w worrying about Whimsicott and Urshi now after EYC. Does that mean it's time for Mew to pop back up? Does that mean it's time that now top players might choose Mew? Um, if not every deck is a hate deck? I actually do think it is probably a time for Mew. It's, it's in a good spot that I would safely assume that maybe some top players would be playing it. I know like if I were going to Indy that I think it'd be my top choice next uh, to Urshi. Like, I'd probably fall back to Urshi if I were going, but I would definitely strongly, strongly consider Mew. Right. I just think, like you said, it's in a great place right now just because, as Frank mentioned, it's probably less targeted than it was before. It's probably the least targeted it's been since the first event in Brisbane, to be honest. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And also, like you said, Urshi is a reasonable deck to keep as a default because you said it's pretty malleable. You know, you can yeah. like do kind of what you want with it. Um, I think... Oh, hi, Frank. That, sorry, if it's okay if I interject. Yeah, go for I, it. I think that, um, you know, there aren't a ton of ways to just, like, really, like, hinder Mew, right? And I think Mew, a good Mew player can, you know, deal with Arshi and deal with Whimsicott, like, fairly well if they build their deck correctly. And, then, you know, the other decks you really have to worry about are, like, Malamar, which isn't really being played because Avery is so high, and um, Arceus. And I think Arceus right now is so preoccupied with, like, not getting destroyed by Urshifu that they're like kind of sacrificing their 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 Mew matchup as well. And so I, I, I think like that's I guess a reason as for why like Mew is is in a good spot and why people aren't teching against it. Because I think like every deck is really worried about somebody else right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's starting to feel that way for sure. Um we're gonna go ahead to uh the second half of question eight on the outline. Um a lot of Arceus decks are being played. If you combine all of the Arceus decks, they're actually the number one most popular deck. Um, I don't know, again, for EUIC, we don't have the numbers, but for the previous couple events. Um, we're seeing Arceus with Beedrill, Arceus and Teleon, Arceus Beeberl with Lycanroc VMAX, with Crobat VMAX, with Hoopa V, Malamar VMAX. We're seeing a lot of Arceus decks get to top 64, top 32, top 16. Um, what is stopping... Arceus from dominating events even if it's so versatile um is it just less consistent is it fragile are the top players not picking it up for some reason um Justin do you have any particular thoughts about Arceus variants or any of the Arceus decks in specific uh so I think what makes I guess makes it hard for Arceus uh, to have as much dominance as maybe some of the other decks is probably because it has to worry about so many different types of decks it's not like they can build their deck to focus on one deck and then it kind of like we mentioned before kind of hit multiple matchups mm -hmm. like you have to kind of dedicate your game plan to beat urshi for example then like frank mentioned you're going to sacrifice the mu matchup so you might not hit everything and then like as you go through a 14 round tournament there's like variance in the matchups you hit and then you also have to draw well as well so just all those factors go into probably uh in my opinion why rcs hasn't done as well as uh most people would have expected okay so basically it's kind of being spread a little too thin almost exactly or yeah. if you don't spread it too thin then you hit one of the things that are taking advantage of the text you didn't include yeah that's okay. yeah, my opinion frank do you have differing thoughts on arceus um no i i mean i think that really kind of hits the nail on the head i, th I think arceus just you know it, it is a very good deck and it's very consistent and it, it, it obviously searching two cards and if you play with Inteleon, just like searching your deck for any trainer but there's only like so much you can fit in there right right and just like with this varying meta game and rc is just being such a uh a, a targeted quantity as well it just like can't deal with everything like you just need to hit the right matchups for the way you build your deck and for a lot of people that just like hasn't really happened in their tournament runs yet um i know um, frank you mentioned kind of the core the desert storm core from charlie's ninth place list in slc kind of came from your arceus beedrill urshifu list which turned into charlie's arceus beedrill sentaconda list and now people are putting lycanroc in there people are going back to urshifu but um do you i don't know if you've seen the arceus and teleon beedrill lists and the arceus mu celebration beedrill lists but beedrill in general with arceus do you think beedrill helps you cover a multitude of decks all at once do you think it's consistent enough to go the distance i think that deck is awesome but i just haven't figured out how it beats urshifu yet okay i think that is one of the harder arceus variants to deal with urshifu yeah 
Because your Beedrill um, wants I to hit it's... special energy, and Urshifu can discard its special energy, or just attach a fighting. Yeah, and at that point, you're just like an Arc Intel deck that's like not prepared for, for one of your worst matchups. Like, obviously, yeah. Yeah, it's a cool deck. I think it's awesome. I think the Beedrill is sweet against Mew, and I think you can do like sneaky stuff in Mirror, and it's like a good card in general. But I, I just think like the way the metagame's at right now, it might need to, uh, you know, take a break for a minute. Yeah, for sure. Um, Beats Wim's got. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Justin, did you have any thoughts on the Beedrill variants in specific? Uh, no, not in particular. I, like, Arceus is probably the deck I've played the least. I don't even think I've played a set with Arceus. Like, okay. I started testing, you know, for UIC just straight with Urshifu. I played against Arceus a right. lot, uh, but I've probably played Urshifu and Mew the most. Okay. Um, so we're hitting the 50-minute mark here. We'll go with this questions real quick, and then we'll wrap it up with, uh, kind of our predictions for MetaShare and your top plays. Um, so... How do you decide which deck you want to take a rough matchup against? Um, either using this metagame as a specific or just in general. Um, do you ever decide that you just take a bad matchup here or do you try to tech your deck out to beat all the top decks? Uh, we'll go Frank. Yeah, I think it just depends on like what you... I mean, like not every deck can be prepared for every single thing, right? And so you you're going to have to take those losses somewhere. So I definitely, if I'm trying to win a tournament, uh, the biggest thing for me is considering, well, what are, what, what is a meta share going to look like? Like if I'm going to take a bad matchup, I'd like it to be against something that I don't think is going to be as popular. And the other thing I think about is like, which players are going to be playing it, right? Mm -hmm. Like I would much rather take a bad matchup to a deck that I don't think is going to be piloted by a lot of day two players that are, you know, like, you know, top American players or top players at the tournament then um i w would <clears throat> excuse me to like another deck so like for instance when i was talking about the whimsicott earlier i knew most of the top players are going to be playing urshifu so i was like i want to make sure my urshifu matchups unlock like i don't want to take a bad urshifu matchup whereas like maybe another deck like like um malamar for example the whimsicott deck didn't have the best malamar matchup i put into avery did my best but i knew that was going to be kind of an uphill battle um, and so I, I didn't feel like a lot of um, players were going to be playing Malamar or a lot of players that were going for like their stipend or traveling or, or, or you know, that I expected to see in day two were going to play. Like there was only like one or two Malamar in day two, for instance. Got it. Got and it, so got it, that got was kind of where I like chose to take my bad matchup. And that's just an example. Right. So like, you wanted you were more worried about doing well in day two than getting to day two. Yeah, I mean, I figured, like, I didn't think there would be a ton of Malamar. Like, I didn't think it was great for the tournament. Um, and I thought that if people who were playing Malamar um, probably would not, you know, I think they would take, I didn't think the deck would do well. Right. And so I figured even if people, a bunch of people played it, if I could just win my first, like, three or four rounds and then get into the 4-0 bracket, I didn't think there'd be a lot of Malamar there. That's and fair. So, um, yeah, even if it was, like, a prominent force, like, I, I just, like, was hoping to dodge it for the first couple of rounds and then just, like, kind of coast and that, that's what happened justin do you have any different way that you prioritize which deck you need to do well against opposed to which one you'll take a loss to or a probable loss to no basically what frank said to be honest like that's usually my approach when i go into what decks i want to take a loss what will to. be five percent what'll be 15 percent yeah i don't like that yeah um and then uh you'll like, I'll usually look, obviously, what the most popular deck is, and if something's centralized and you have, like, three, de like, a big three, for example, I definitely do not want to lose to any of those three, but for the most part, it kind of just follows what Frank just said. So, we kind of have a big three, right? Urshi, Arceus, Mew? Yeah, I would think so, yeah. Um, would, which one would you lose to going in? Like, I'm telling you right now, you have to beat two of them and lose to one in indiana i know you're not going which one do you lose to in indiana or which one do you take a probable loss to in indiana rcs is so broad i think i'd have to go mew probably just because there's just so many different things with rcs if i had to choose one i'd probably be mew okay right now what if i said rcs and teleon urshi and mew rcs and teleon okay because i do I think rcs and teleon and Arceus boxes are quite different in their matchup spreads. Yes, I agree. Yeah, so, I agree. All right, that's cool. All right, um, so last question. What do you think? Uh, I'll shorten it. Originally, we were going to do seven most represented archetypes, but let's do the five most represented archetypes uh, from number one to number five. 
in uh, how popular you think they'll be. If you had already written down seven most, then that's fine. We can do that. But um, yeah, for Indianapolis regionals, we're expecting 900 plus masters. Um, so what do you think the most represented archetypes will be from first to however low you had prepared uh, archetypes for? And um, if you're talking about Arceus decks, we can divide them by Arceus and Teleon, Arceus Biberal, Arceus Other. Um, Justin, you want to go first? Okay, so I think uh, one will still probably be Mew. Mm -hmm. um, two, I would probably go like Arceus Box. Mm -hmm. Um, just like a toolbox type thing, I guess similar to the Sylveon that we saw in um top eight. So at like USC. Arceus Bibberal and then a V Max line, like yeah. Lycanroc, Rock Sylveon, like Crobat V Max, yeah. Hoopa V, all that yeah. kind of stuff. Um, and then I think three would probably be Arceus and Teleon, maybe like Arceus and Teleon B Drill, or maybe something straight with like the Mana Fee Dunsparce package I yeah. mentioned earlier. We can toss all that into Arceus and Tel, whether it has the okay, like cool. one Galarian Molt Trace Dark Energy, or if it's just Blue yeah. and Melanie, or yeah. So I think that would be three. Four, I think, would be Whimsicott. I think five would be Urshi. Um, six would be. Like Malamar and then seven, I would probably represent everything else. Okay, awesome. So the high representation for Whimsicott, we'll have to check those yes. numbers and uh, <laughs> not, maybe not supremacy. All right, how about you, Frank? The same question. I I'm actually inclined to say the same thing. Pretty much, I think like, or yeah, uh, I'm the biggest thing for me. I don't know is like how people are gonna build their Arceus deck. Like how many people are gonna go with the box style and how many. Yeah, people it's are gonna so go hard. It's like to... <laughs> that. I don't know how people are playing Arceus, and I don't know if like one of those two ways will be above Mew. But like top top Mew Arceus still. Mm -hmm. Um, I I think there will be a good, more Arceus box style decks than Italian. I think people switch away from it a little bit. Um. I definitely playing like the barrel and like a hoopa line and some other weird stuff. I saw one with like ditto and a bunch of basic attackers that actually looked really good. Um, and then, then caught the nursery. He, yeah, I, I think that's the nail on the head. I so think you think Whimsicott kind of how... can be more popular in Urshi, Frank? Yeah. Oh, I think it will be. Okay. Oh, you know, maybe that's my ego, but um, I think it will be. I think also some people were talking about Arc Drought and, um, I think there'll be more Drowd and than we've seen in quite some time. Yeah, I'm expecting um, Arceus Drowd on to be in the top seven for this tournament. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I like it. I played it at a full grip. I played it at my locals and like I won, but also I like hated it. But also, <laughs> you hated winning. <laughs> I like I was like, oh, this deck's bad, but also like I won with it. I don't know. So. Well, you guys gave a lot of good information. Unfortunately, we're wrapping up around the hour mark. Sorry for keeping you guys a little bit later. Um, but I've kind of come to thinking that it's a little bit, uh, not monotonous, but almost like we're, you know, we're over a week away from re Indiana regionals. Justin's here to lend his knowledge and input, but he's not going. Frank, I'm sure, has so many decks to test still. So I'm not going to ask you guys you know, what deck would you be playing for Indiana Regionals? Because it's over a week away, your options are probably going to change. But if you have advice for people going to their first Regionals, um, what would you tell them? Uh, Justin. Uh, so if this is your first Regionals, I would say um, don't be nervous. Obviously, it's hard not to be nervous. It's your first big tournament. Uh, just enjoy the experience as the first one. Um, have don't uh, set any expectations just go in trying to learn and then trying to improve and uh, pick a deck you're comfortable with so that you'll be able to play every round and uh, just be ready for a long day that's it <laughs> how about you frank yeah i mean that's um pretty similar to what i wanted to say definitely is just like especially you know don't go in and like be upset if you don't day two your first regional or something like that or or, or um you know just like just take it in like enjoy your first regional experience it's an amazing time definitely try and be more focused on just like you know hanging out with people and making new friends and getting the experience rather than like the the winning of it all like i think you know i've played in like dozens of, of regionals and i didn't really start worrying about winning until like a, you know i had a couple under my belt for sure just uh, go there yeah. enjoy yourself um 
pack uh, some snacks and like some Advil. Like you're gonna have a headache by round round nine if you're you play all your rounds and uh, you know definitely um, you know plan get some good sleep, drink lots of water, plan for the longevity of the day, and uh, yeah, definitely don't stress about it too much. You know, if you see some crazy deck the night before, don't just pick it up and go play it. Like just just. You know, trust in yourself yes. and your preparation. Do just play with what you're comfortable with. Go in and just have a good time. Yeah, I was just gonna say, Frank, the that was one that you guys didn't mention that I wanted to say. Like the the dream scenarios you hear about about where people build their deck the night before and they win the event, those are far and few between and they're usually not that person's first regional. <laughs> No, 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 um, no. <laughs> all right guys well thank you so much for being on here um do you have any shout outs uh frank then justin um just follow me on twitter at uh, steak frank like the meat and not the piece of wood um and yeah again just like shout out to um my my testing partner for uic cyrus i could not have gotten my finish without them so that was super awesome and then um shout out to everybody that has just been congratulating me and, and tweeting at me and like super overwhelming. So I, I can't say, you know, how much I, I just love the community so much and, you know, shout out to everybody that's been just so kind. Justin. Okay. Uh, shout out to big money, Bradner, um, Isaiah, <laughs> nickname inside joke. Um, <laughs> shout out to John Ang, uh, Michael Slutsky, <laughs> uh, Rahul, Sam Chen, um, Reagan, Retzloff, uh, my brother for making the EU, EUIC fun and making the testing enjoyable and just making the experience a great experience. Uh, shout out to you for having me on and uh, Luke and shout out to Frank for getting second with the cots, <laughs> representing the cots. <laughs> all right, guys, thank you so much. And uh, thank you all uh, the viewers listening and watching at home. If you are going to Indiana regionals, um, hopefully I'll see you there and hopefully you have a great time. And um, if there's anything else you would like to hear us talk about in these kind of discussions, you can leave it in the comments down below. I do these for every North American regionals and some foreign events. So um, I'll take any comments into consideration for what we should prepare for for future episodes. But thank you so much for watching here today on Celio's Network, and I'll see you all next time.